Good morning, saints of God. Hallelujah. Here we are. Post-Easter. God is good. Been a wonderful presence of the Lord in my home study this morning. And uh, certainly here as I am preparing to live stream. Before I forget, I want to give a shout out to my wife. 45 year wedding anniversary today. And... uh, my number four girl said, put it in your notes so you don't forget. Well, how could you forget 45 years of marriage, right? Except for the fact that I was so young when we got married. I don't remember being there. But uh, God is good. So, Teresa, I love you. 45 years, wonderful. God is good. Let's open in prayer this morning and let's go to the Word and see what God has for us. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise your holy name. We thank you for the Word of God. It truly is living and active and very sharp. And it divides. It gives us faith and conduct and reality against a world that has an antichrist flavor and trying to whitewash and define who we are and what Christianity is. We well, thank God that we can go to the Word and, and glean from it and be built up and be able to stand by it for all time and for all eternity. Lord, blessings we pray on everyone that's tuned in this morning. Pray a blessing on all of my fam- family, extended family that's joined on to our live streaming and those in the church and all around and anyone, whether we have met you or not. We just thank you for being with us this morning. And I pray the Lord touch you and lift you up in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles again this Sunday to Matthew uh, 27. And uh, and last Sunday. I, I, I spoke Easter, I spoke on this whole concept of the temple veil. And I mentioned that then that Matthew also made some other comments about Easter that none of the other synoptic gospels jumped in on. In other words, he was the sole witness of a few things that happened. And I want to go back to that today because the Lord stirred that in me. And even though it would be what some would consider a problematic text, even though there are some what we would call problematic texts, there's always stuff within the realm of the context of the text. Boy, that's a mouthful that you can still glean from. So I want to go back there. So in Matthew 27, I'm going to read four verses here. Actually, uh, yeah, starting at verse 50, Matthew 27, verse 50. Follow along. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold... The veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Verse 52 says the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. And then verse 54 says now the centurion And those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. It's an amazing, amazing text. And as I said last Sunday, we focused on the temple veil, which really signified... uh, as it was torn from top to bottom, it dramatically symbolized that the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross, the shedding of his own blood, was sufficient atonement for the sins of all time, for all people. And now, with the temple uh, veil being torn, the way into the Holy of Holies was open for all people, for all time, both Jew and Gentile. Acts really... Uh, beef set up when Acts 17.24 says, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. It's against that narrative that, or that background that Matthew then presents Jesus the Messiah as not merely the sacrifice for sin, but its conqueror. And in doing so, also list this remarkable little group of happenings that we just read. 
that were associated with his death in these verses 51 through 54. And then he links them all together. And I want you to look at this again. He links them all together with the Greek word kai that we translate in English to the word and. So if you look at Matthew 27 again, I want to key in on these words. Verse 50, Matthew says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and kai yielded up his spirit kai and behold, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom kai and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city. Now, what's interesting to me is Matthew is, I've, I've tried to just, I, I do this a lot. I try to just get into the head, into the context, into the original language, try to just get into the head of the author and the event and try to figure out, so what is he really trying to tell us? Because only Matthew records those events. Now, all four of the Gospels record the crucifixion. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the temple being torn from top to bottom. And they mention the centurion in his gang that was watching to make sure that no one stole the body or that Jesus didn't come off the cross until he died. But only Matthew puts in these events of the earthquake and the, and the rock splitting and the tombs opened. And the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, they were raised up. And they came out of the tombs and they went into the city and they appeared to many. And I've looked at that and it is a bit of a problematic text because Matthew's the only one that adds that. Now, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I want to be straight up. I believe in the literal rendering or translation of what the Bible is saying because that's the only way that you can truly understand. And I want you to know this. Anyone can read their Bibles and the Holy Spirit has promised to illuminate your minds. And you will be able to know and discern and be able to glean from it. So it's not that you can't, but every once in a while you'll run across a text that might be problematic. The commentators are all over the place in this. Some say, yes, it literally happened and it should be interpreted literally. Others would say, no, it's it's just it's it's part of a poetic, symbolic addition that Matthew put in later or some or some scribe put in later. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And I guess the point is, it's in my Bible. When I read that, and especially around Easter, it just it spurs me on to try to glean what, it, what, was, what was Matthew saying, and this happened, and this, and, and by the way, this, and this, and this, and they did this. And trying to get into his head was an amazing time. I spent a lot of time this week uh, searching all of the different commentaries and the, the, the scholars, uh, those guys that looked at it, some would say, yes, it literally happened. You just take it, leave it, forget it, set it and forget it. Others would say, no, 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 it can't be this. And the reason it's problematic is no one else attempts to address what happened. In other words, look at it this way. If, in fact, they literally, the rocks literally split open, and the dead were raised up, you have a lot of other problematic issues that are happening that kicks against other scriptural precedents or doctrine that you have to consider. Let me suppose to you a few questions that I ask myself. In other words, I don't know if it happened literally or not, but if they did in, happen in real time, as Matthew said, then who were these people and who did they appear to? And it happened on Good Friday. Jesus is the first fruits. So you can't have resurrected people before Jesus is resurrected. So they either, the tombs were split and they stayed in the tombs and then come out. And it says after his resurrection, but then did they not come to life until that time? Or what happened? And if there was a resurrection of some of the saints, was it to immortality or was it temporary like Lazarus? And if they did stick around and appear to many, who did they talk to and why didn't somebody else say something? If it was one of the patriarchs of old, some, some one commentator, several suggested, well, it was probably Elijah or Elisha or David. Well, if David or Elijah or Zechariah or somebody went into the city, 
somebody would have recorded that and they would have met with the disciples and there would have been a record. If not biblically, then extra biblically. So, so there's just other problematic issues that pop up when you start asking the questions. And why didn't Jesus mention these after his own resurrection? And again, if they were around, why didn't they join the apostles? And we didn't hear the testimony of that on the day of Pentecost. I mean, it's just an amazing situation that happened here, yet it's in my Bible, it's in your Bible. And rather than skate away from something that's problematic, I really prayed through this, and I, I really found, to my amazement, even though I can't definitively define whether it was real time or not, there's absolutely so much here to encourage me that I can glean from, from it. Because whatever Matthew was saying there, I know he was saying this, there's a new age that's breaking through. And that a decisive stage in this new age, this new covenant, which was present and largely future, has been brought about by the dying of Jesus on the cross, which makes it all possible. That's what I believe is. I believe Matthew's given us this profound, this, this profound and, oh, oh, and, and meditation. And, they and, I see him as given us this profound insight on what the crucifixion of Jesus means for the destiny of all humankind. That's why I believe Matthew wants us to believe that these events were speaking of an eschatological or an end time event yet to happen. In other words, right here, Matthew's given us a snapshot or a foretaste of the world, which fits into the overall rhetorical devices and strategies used by Matthew and the rest of his gospel. In other words, if you take Matthew's gospel in its entirety, knowing that he wrote to a Christian a Judeo, a, a Jewish Christian audience was his focus and his purpose, he was likely pulling upon their Jewish prophetic history to tie what just happened on the cross together. In other words, you can't help but, but look at this and see Ezekiel 37 with the Valley of Dry Bones coming alive again, again in, in this message. And in Daniel chapter 1, where many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awaken to everlasting life. And you can see Zechariah 14 in that, where he speaks of the rocks of Jerusalem that will be split open at the coming of the king. They were all prophetic signs. What I want to say is this. I really sense Matthew writing to a, to a, to a Jewish focus point is pulling against their history, their prophetic history, and his ands, and, and, I can just see Matthew, and I've done this before in my mind, just pulling, tagging prophetic things together to make a statement that has reality of the actual thing that happened, Jesus dying on the cross in real time, but also linking all time and eternity. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing event. Some scholars even want to argue over whether it was the outer veil or the inner veil that was torn and who saw it. And the fact that if it was torn on the inside, no one would have seen it except the rabbis and they would have covered it up because they were trying to cover up the whole Easter narrative of Jesus being the Messiah, claiming to be God. It's an amazing, amazing time. But here's what I know. Here's what Matthew is telling me. The salvation of God has come to earth in the man Christ Jesus, and it was accomplished on the cross. And you have this dramatic illustration that the long-awaited turn of the ages, the hinge point where redemptive history turns from old covenant into new covenant, and it was done, and it was accomplished when Jesus said, it is finished. So either way, whether you believe that it was actually, that it actually happened in real time, or that Matthew was connecting their prophetic history into one event, the spiritual symbolic images of what he recorded still, it still speaks to us today. And that's really what I want to look at in the last few minutes of this message. So let me just pull you back to the veil. Think about the veil for a minute. You had this veil, which was this physical barrier between the holy place. God decided to reveal himself to the nation of Israel, to the Jew. And he designed this whole dynamic from the garden on. He knew that 
the, he would have to put the old covenant in place. There would have to be a substitution for sins because until he came to earth in the man, in the, in the word, with the second person of the Trinity, the son of God, and offered his own sacrifice for sins, a sinless, shameless, perfect sacrifice as a second Adam, that there would have to be the covering of blood. We know that the high priest could only go behind the veil at Passover and only once a year to atone for the sins, but it had to happen year after year after year. So it wasn't efficacious. It didn't have the power to forgive us forever. And that veil stood as this reminder of not only the holiness of God, but the sinfulness of man, because all of the normal sin offerings were offered up against the veil on one side with the presence of God manifest on the other side. And when that veil was torn from top to bottom, there's so much there, and we touched a little bit last Sunday, but only God could have torn that from the top down. And what meant by the covering of the veil that man in his sinfulness could not enter in, yet be literally killed by the holiness and the presence of God because of their sinful state, now meant God was opening the way for us. And it all happened to become the new temple. And that happened on the day of Pentecost where the Spirit of God was poured out. Now it's not about the building. It's not about a specific place. It's about us and the Spirit of God being resident in us. That is still so humbling for me. A, a man like me, when I got saved back in 1985, I, I cried. I've said it so many times. I literally cried and read my Bible for the first six months of my salvation. I could not believe a man of age 30 could have lived 30 years in such ignorance, thinking that, yeah, there's just a higher power. There's just somebody, some God, yet ignorant of all that he did for me. Romans 5, 8, while I was still a, a sinner, Christ died for me. When that revelation came, it, it, it pulls the whole temple veil and everything together for me because Christ died for me so that I could have access through a sinner's prayer to have literally the presence of God dwell in me now in the Holy Spirit. That to me is amazing. If you look at the earthquake, the earthquake is very common in biblical literature and it draws in part, at least from Ezekiel 37, where we have this vision of the valley of dry bones where an earthquake in verse 7 precedes the opening of the graves and the resurrection of the people who return into the land of Israel. And in Matthew's contents, or context, it indicates this dramatic manifestation of God as a climatic event in his redemptive historical plan. I can see Matthew in his mind just, oh yeah, and it was prophesied, and, and oh, and, 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 kai, uh, kai, kai, talking to this Jewish people, pulling all of these events together. It's amazing to me. The tombs that were opened, also very problematic. And at the very least, again, recalling Ezekiel 37, where the Lord says to the prophet, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. Again, whether it was literal in real time or it was prophetic, symbolic, Matthew's telling us that one day, oh my gosh, one day when the Lord returns, when we take our last breath, the Bible tells us we are absent from the body, present to the Lord. One day the Christ will return, the sound of the trumpet, and we'll all be gathered again together. And again, what Ezekiel had prophesied and what was happening at the cross is an illustration of a prophetic, prophesied, promised event of God that will happen again one day. Amazing. You have this other dynamic here of the raising of the few. In other words, not all of the saints were raised that day. It says that some were raised out of the grave. Well, who were they? Was it a select bunch? Another part of this text being problematic. And who did they appear to? Again, we looked at that. But what this shows me is this. It doesn't matter who they were. But he says, and some were raised up. The implication from silence is some were not. And really that speaks loudly to me that he who has a son has life, and he who does not have the son does not have life. In other words, just some being raised that day symbolically is telling me that if I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, 
that tomb's not going to open for me one day. The rocks aren't going to split for me. If I'm not saved and washed by the blood of the Lamb, if, I, if I'm not a born-again true believer of Christ, then what is happening here will not happen for me by my choice. And it's very humbling to think, not only have I chosen Jesus as Lord and Savior, but it's humbling also to think about those who only believe in a higher power. It's just what I call Graysville. You can't live in Graysville. It has to be one or the other. It's not my argument. It's not me to condemn or to judge anyone other than to issue you an, a glorious opportunity to know for sure that when you take your last breath, you'll be present with the Lord and or at the return of Christ, we'll all be translated up to be with the Lord. And then it says that the dead entered into the holy city and appeared to many. I, I would think that perhaps we are a little too earthbound in our thinking of the holy city as the present day Jerusalem, because it could very well have been that Matthew had a glimpse of the Jerusalem, which is above the heavenly city when he speaks of the bodies of the people entering into the city after the resurrection of Jesus. Perhaps he prefers or refers to his conviction, maybe reinforced by a vision. I don't know that the cross and the resurrection of Jesus have passed or paved the way into heaven for God's people down all the ages. We just don't know. <laughs> but knowing that Jesus has died and conquered death through his resurrection ought to hasten our desire to repent and trust him alone for salvation so we too can one day one day be resurrected what a glorious thought what a glorious thought so let me close with these final thoughts it goes down to the centurion and those let me look in your bibles at matthew verse 54 and just follow along here and you can join me on the piano, please. It says in Matthew 27, 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake, and the things that were happening. So what all did they see? They became very frightened and in their fear, they got a revelation. In other words, I want to encourage you, if you're watching now live streaming or you'll listen to this video later. If you get a conviction of your heart that you may be left behind or you may be left out. Or if you get a conviction that maybe you really don't know who Jesus really is. Or the old question, if you were to die today, do you know that you know that you would go to heaven? If you don't really know, I would encourage you. Fear is a good thing. Fear is a good thing because fear right here caused this centurion, his cohorts, to look at the events. They were sent there to crucify the Lord and stand watch over him because they knew that Jesus had said he would, if you were to tear him down in three days, he would rise again. That's why they guarded the tomb. They were going to make sure that no one came along and stole the body, took him down, resuscitated him, if that were even possible. When they looked at the events, these are very, very unlikely people. Here's what I see in this account. Some of the most unlikely people, right then and there, when Jesus said it is finished, they heard the words of what Jesus said. He forgave literally the ones Possibly these were the guys that nailed him to the cross. They hurled insults at him. They listened to the two criminals, one on each side, one of them being offered salvation when he took responsibility for his sins. And they became fearful. It's an interesting concept. Afraid? Afraid of what? Afraid of the truth being true. How about that? So what if this gospel message is true? <laughs> it should bring a little fear if you don't know Jesus. The ones that were set in place were the ones that made confession. 
Now, Matthew and uh, a few of the other Gospels, they bring this forward and they mention him. And I thought, why mention him and only Matthew everything else? And how important is that? If the veil was rent from top to bottom, now opening the way for the Jew and the Gentile alike, here you have some Gentiles, some of the first guys recorded saying, truly, he was the Son of God. This is true. I remember years ago when we, right after we got saved, it was uh, 1993 when we left our home church and we planted the Olympia Metro Church. It was in November, November 7th, 1993, when we left. We started in the Olympia Community Center. Having been a part of Evergreen Christian Church back then, Christian Community Now, having been an active part there, a pastor on staff in the children's department and very active in their drama ministry, every year we would put on a big Easter production, and I was always one of the characters playing a major role in, in a lot of what they did. So leaving that church... I remember I wrote for my first year, it had to have been 1994, the first Easter. I wrote this one-man dialogue centered around this centurion. And the Lord quickened this back, and I spent some time in my prayer chair at home thinking about this. In other words, I took the gospel narrative, and I wrote, the, I, I wrote this one-man narrative in costume, in a centurion's costume, and we had... Other actors, no lines, we had music, and it was all intermixed around the testimony of this one centurion. And the key was, at the very end of the drama, I said, surely, this was the Son of God. I will never forget. I poured my heart into that production. And I'm not tuning my own horn, but I, whether it was good or bad, I gave it the time, I gave it the effort. I will never forget standing on the stage in the community center. I don't even remember how many people were there. Um, I imagine there was probably only 75 or 100 people there. But I gave an altar call, standing there in my Roman centurion outfit, my white legs. I always get the comment, you had such white chicken legs. Tears in my eye, and I gave a, an altar call for salvation. There was one hand that went up that day for salvation, one hand. And I remember pausing for a minute. I saw the one hand go up because I said, just like the centurion, if you want Jesus, raise your hand. I want to pray a sinner's prayer. One hand. I'm going to be honest with you. I was a little disappointed because I was gauging, watch this, I was gauging the response to the amount of effort I put into it, put a lot of effort into it. One hand. The young man's name was David. David prayed a sinner's prayer. David connected with the church. David grew in the church. David's family connected with the church. And then one day at age 35, David had a medical condition. He slipped into a coma. And he died at age 35. I remember then, and I, I, it, Lord brought it back to my remembrance as I was preparing for this sermon. The fact that the gospel remembers the centurion and doesn't even give us his name gives us so much to rejoice over that everything that happened that day, literal, prophetic, a mix, whatever it was, the door was opened and somebody said, Truly, that was the Son of God. And with the centurion and with David, when we did David's funeral, I could never forget just the, the Easter that was for him. And because of that, when he took his last breath on earth at a very young age, he was translated into the very presence of God. Look, I want to encourage you today, and I do, I want to pray for all of us out there. 
I know I'm kind of all over the place with this message, but I want you to understand this. Matthew's telling us some amazing things that are all true. They're true prophetically. They are true within the context or the pale of orthodoxy. They're true about the promises of God. One day, graves are going to split. God's going to return. They're all true within the context of the whole biblical narrative, whether it was real time or not. And I would encourage you, don't, get, don't stumble over facts like that, but just know this. We are the building. COVID-19 has run us out of our church buildings and we're at stay home time, all of us. And we have to gather via live stream. But let me tell you what, you're out there and I'm here, but we can rejoice in your hand and my hand together that we are known by God, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And that one day, one day, when we take our last breath, It'll count for time and for eternity. I just want to pray for everyone listening today. Why don't you just do this? Why don't you bow your heads with me as we go to prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you said as recorded in 1 John, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Father, that's not judgmental that's fact we need you we need you as lord and savior we need what easter provided for us laid to our account you took the sins of the world upon you on that cross you were tempted in every way just as we are the bible says yet you were without sin and you paid the ultimate price that i today can enter through that veil which is your flesh and have eternal life. I pray for everyone listening out there right now. If you don't know Jesus or you're backslidden or, hey, whatever your condition is, it's you and God. You know where you stand with God. Just pray this prayer right now and ask Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Come back into my heart. Come into my heart for the first time. Come in. I want to be like that centurion. I want to be like David. Count my hand. Count my hand right now. I just raise my hand for salvation and I say, Lord, forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And Jesus, guide me, lead me, and be my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, I receive you right now into my heart. Oh, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. The words of Jesus to Martha ring out in my spirit today too where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. I want to encourage you all, wherever you are in all your homes right now, look to Jesus, look to God. Look to these magnificent events that happened on Easter. Easter comes so fast and it goes and I just couldn't help but continue to reflect on the power of the cross, everything that Jesus did. You can't preach it all or say it all in one message, but the reflections of that veil and the tombs and the centurion, it all just, it just was ringing out in my spirit, and I wanted to bring it back today. So I want to encourage you with that. I pray that you are blessed by that, and I pray that if you prayed that sinner's prayer, connect, connect here at Maytown Church, connect at your local church, wherever you are. Connect somewhere and tell somebody what you just did. Tell somebody what you just prayed. Uh, And we can encourage you and get you going to where you can know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. With that, I want to praise God for His gratefulness and His goodness, and I want to thank you today. Remember, you can go to to Give. You can go to uh, MaytownAG.com and... uh, We don't take any, we're not receiving tithes and offerings here because there's no one here at the church. So you can go there and hit the give button and you can send your tithes, your missions offerings, whatever you have there and it'll all be received. So we thank you for that. Final prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your kingdom come on earth. Let it come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your day.